Hi, everybody. Welcome everyone here on Appledore Island and out there on the internet. Uh, welcome to Shoals Marine Lab's weekly marine science seminar. And it is live this summer, obviously, from the island. And I am Dr. Jennifer Seavey. I'm the executive director of Shoals. And every summer, we welcome all of our students and our community, students here on the island and our community online, to join us for these seminars. So tonight's guest is Dr. Larry Alade, and he is a supervisory research fisheries biologist at NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center in Woods Hole. He has a really cool combination of degrees. I just wanna point out how, uh, you can ask him how he's combined these things. A PhD in marine estuarine and environmental science at the University of Maryland Western Shore a master's degree in applied uh, computer science at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, and uh, undergraduate in biology from the University of Maryland. As a supervisory research fisheries biologist, Larry is responsible for contributing and overseeing fishery stock assessments for over 50 species of fish and invertebrates in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. And he's going to be talking to us this evening about complexities and challenges of fishery stock assessments and implications for fisheries management. So welcome, Larry. We're really ha happy to have you with us. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for that introduction. Um, really happy to be here to join you virtually. I wish it could be in person, but you know, due to life circumstances, you know, um, you know, we have to bring abundance of greetings from Cape Cod. So, but I'm really excited to join you on your seminar series uh, this evening, and really begin to talk to you about some of the challenges and some of the, you know, really interesting dynamics of like you know stock assessment and what we do at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. So, with that said, uh, I guess. Uh, just to really uh, get a sense of like, you know, that you can see my slides, you can hear me clearly. Are we good to go and ready to jump in? Can somebody confirm? We can hear you great. We can't see Excellent. your slides yet. We can't see my slides yet. Okay, so let's do that. And how about now? That looks great. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, so to, you know I've been with the Northeast Fishery Science Center since 2008, and uh, you know I've been fortunate to uh, lead a number of stock assessments, uh, particularly uh, ground fish stock assessments, and you know recently became supervisor where oversee staff, but still involved in sort of the nuts and bolts of the science. And so, you know, really looking back and having this invitation to come talk to you, wanted to kind of really, in retrospect, go back and talk to you about some of, you know, the complexity and challenges I've experienced as a stock assessment scientist, but not necessarily unique to me, but it's more, you know, uh, broadly uh, issues that we face and some of the challenges that with regards to like, you know, doing the science and providing management advice. So I figured that, you know, we'll dive into the complexity challenges of stock assessment and really understand that, you know, when there's serious challenges that we've been faced when it comes to the science, we still have to operate under the mandate to provide advice for fisheries management. So with that said, I'm going to move to my next slide just to kind of give you a sense of uh, today's menu, what it looks like. Uh, I figured that, you know, given the broad audience that we have for participating, that maybe it would be worthwhile sort of going back, you know, to the basics you know, what stocks assessment is all about and what the mandate is. And the way to maybe to show that is to perhaps give you a sense of what the peer review looks like, which is typically about like, you know, three to five days. And I figure we can condense that into a three hour meeting or conversation tonight. But, you know, just to be mindful of people's time, perhaps maybe it's another day for a conversation that we can talk extensively. And so I promise to keep this within a time limit that's reasonable and Jen will keep me honest and keep me on time to make sure I end on time so we can have time for a conversation. But really what I wanted to talk to, it looks really, um, you know, dense, but it's not really a whole lot here. Really want to go back to the basic of what stock assessment's all about, the importance of it, you know, the mandate under which we are operating. Talk about the process and maybe pick a couple of uh, case studies that I've been involved in over the course of my career. And sort of like begin to look forward to some of the current advancements in the future and some take home messages. So to maybe set the stage here, uh, I think it's really useful to really, uh, really understand, you know, the 
importance and where stock assessment, you know, why do we do it? You know, it's science that we do, but it does inform resource management. And we're all very well familiar with this phrase of the tragedy of the commons. You know, it's a term that's commonly used in social sciences and is used to describe a situation in a common shared resource system where individual users act independently according to their own self-interest. And it's kind of contra contrary to the broader interest, uh, interest of uh, individuals who are involved. And we know that there are downstream uh, consequences for that, that the cost is being borne to all who are the resources as available to. And so this uh, ends up resulting in uh, depletion of resources where we have limited availability. And so therefore, when we look at this, that you know, effective management is paramount to ensure that we have sustainability of the resource. And to be able to do that, we need some science to be able to inform those decisions, to be able to make smart decisions. We also recognize playing in the background to uh, shifting baselines that we can control, like natural variability. We know that's the impact of the climate. And how do we begin to like, you know, factor all those external forces when we begin to like, you know, understand how to provide valuable advice to managers. So let's go back. What is stock assessment? And so I love this cartoon here. You know, you come in here and with, you know, really talks about like, you know, uh, the, the message behind here is about how uncertain, you know, uh, numbers can be sometimes. And that's just the reality and the type of um, field we work in, that there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of uh, process errors, there's a lot of measurement errors that we have to deal with. But in plain, simple language, stock assessment is a process where we collect biological and statistical information. And what we're trying to do is understand what the changes in, like, you know, population size in response to exploitation and to the extent possible, be able to use information we know about the history of the population or a stock to be able to forecast what the future trends will really look like. So what essentially are we asking here? We're asking, what is the state of the stock? You're saying a current evaluation of what the current state of the stock is really at, and the rate at which it's being exploited. So we want to know the rates of removals with regards to like, you know, what's available in the, in the population. What has happened? You know, we should be able to construct a dynamic history of the stock and allow to understand what the evaluation of past historical exploitation rates have been. And then with that together, we should be able to, uh, you know, form predictions into the future and we should be able to understand the risk associated with different harvest strategies. So I often say stock assessment is not a one size fits all. You know, there is a variety of um, ways that we have to deal with, you know, the assessment of a population and it's, you know, typically data dependent. Uh, you have uh, cases where you, they're very data intensive, where you use more complicated models. We have circumstances where we have poor data and limited uh, information, but we still have to provide advice and they're limited uh, data limited approaches. And there's the weak data that I also called, and uh, there's a case example I will present here later on, which is the Silver Hague. And I call those model resistant, where you have copious and abund abundant amount of data, but yet the trends and the signals coming out from the data are quite difficult for the models to interpret. So it becomes really complicated. I so say stock assessment, you know, uh, it's very complex. It's not rocket science, not guided by just a set of rules. Uh, we know that the ocean is very vast. We cannot count every critter in the ocean. Uh, there's natural variability, there's unpredictable environment, uh, resource utilization, when we're talking about the interactions between the resource and stakeholders. And now we should even layer that with renewable energy so that, you know, when we think about the utilization of the oceans and how we allocate that to stakeholders, you know, there it becomes a little bit more complex. complex. And so how do we begin to understand how to manage this effectively? And of course, there's also effect of management, which can be quite complicated in terms of like, you know, really bringing this within the modeling framework. So why it's important, you know, stock assessment, you know, really supports coastal and international organizations that they rely on. And so when you really think about this, what it really supports from an economic standpoint, the science supports a sector in which we're making decisions here. So when you really think about the fishery sector, we think about 1.8 million jobs. 
of which like 1.2 million from the commercial sector, about over half a million in the recreational sector. You know, uh, we're talking about, you know, 20, 255 billion in sales, which is quite significant, and then 117 billion in value added. So you're really talking about a sector that has, you know, really huge contribution from an economic standpoint. This is like, you know, a fairly recent report from 2019, sort of kind of giving you the scale and then the magnitude of the contribution of the fishery sector. And so with that said, you know, when we really look at the scale, you know, it's really important that the science is right in terms of like, you know, informing the decisions we make. You know, oftentimes, you know, we may, uh, you know, embrace the, the, you know, the media as well, too. So we know about this story very well, a very iconic and historical fishery here, uh, the decline of cod over the years and how contentious that is. And we also fairly in, in our lifetime here in 2017, we also uh, noticed uh, the story of Carlos Raphael, also known as the Cod Father, who was sentenced to federal prison in 2017 after pleading guilty to over 20 offenses, including false labeling of fish and falsifying federal uh, records. So there's, you know, when you really think about, uh, you know, the utilization of resources, there's also incentives to like, you know, not just do the right thing sometimes, you know, when there is limit, uh, limit amount of resources. But I think for the most part, you know, I think that the industry are trying to do the right things. I think over the years, we can say that there's been a uh, positive like you know relationship between industry and science to kind of really understand where we're going because i think one of the things we've learned along the way is that stakeholder engagement and involvement in our process it's very vital to ensuring that we'll build we're building trust so let's switch gears just quickly here and talk about the U.S. fisheries management laws here. So when we do stock assessment, you know, it's a, I'd say it's operational science. Uh, it's a science that is guided under the mandate here. And so when we think about the several laws in the U.S. here that govern our fisheries management, we know about the Magnuson-Stevenson Fishery uh, Conservation Act. We have the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. And really, they work together. And the, the the Magnuson Act works to prevent overfishing, rebuild overfishing, overfished stocks, increase the long-term economic and social benefits to the fisheries, and ensure that there's a safe and su sustainable uh, seafood supply. And so, just a little bit more on the on the laws here. Uh, the fishery management plans they have to comply with a number of requirements, and so we have the ten national standards there. And it's explicitly says that we have to prevent overfishing while achieving optimal yield. We're trying to reduce bycatch and we're trying to ensure safety at sea. And so when the councils that we operate and we work with who are like, you know, the management bodies here, they must take into account the, the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act into consideration when develop, developing fisheries management plans. And so it's not really done in isolation. You really need to look at the broad uh, landscape of uh, the interactions across all these different laws. And so how do we manage our fisheries? And when we look at the Magnuson Act, there are three pillars here. There's the science, there's the management, and there's the enforcement end. So from the science, we're talking about the stock assessment, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth uh, later on in uh, uh, future slides. And so we're developing this through a peer review process and necessary to manage the long-term sustainability of the resource. We have the management arm here, which is a science-based process, but to ensure that there's continuous, a continuous improvement in our fisheries management plan in response to new scientific information. And so therefore, you know, the managers are always looking for ways to like, you know, make sure that we're, that, you know, keeping us on our toes, that we're providing cutting edge science and things that, you know, can really help them to make better decisions. Cause there's a lot of uncertainty associated, like, you know, we're providing stock assessment advice. And then there's the enforcement, they oversee the compliance side of things and they quickly stop the overfishing if it occurs and rebuild the overfish stock. So they, the eyes and just making sure that things are falling in line and in compliance. And so when you look at it from uh, this type of, you know, visual perspective, uh, and you look at it, you know, uh, the different components, a circle here that assessing the status of, uh, of stocks, and this is where stock assessment comes into play. But that happens, you know, with data collection first, you know, uh, data collection, which requires, you know, reporting of commercial uh, information, uh, recreational information. And then we have our scientific uh, observations too, to monitor what we call discards, which are fish that are like tossed over, but they're considered dead. And then of course, there's the biological information too that we need to take into account. All this information feeding right into, you know, really developing the stock assessment. And then from there, 
we are able to provide information from the stock assessment to set in, you know, catch in the catch targets. And then the regulations comes into play and the cycle continues done. But, you know, it's just not a cycle that just continues without any improvement. It's got to be improvements to be done. And so if you really think into the future here, when we're thinking about renewable energy, when we're thinking about the impact of the environment, we're thinking about ways where we can begin to broaden this scope of how we do stock assessment to make sure that it's more driven by the ecosystems information that really allows us to nail down the trends that we're really seeing and the interactions we're seeing across different populations. So let's talk about models. You know, models can range from, you know, your really simple empirical approach, which is just really taking uh, uh, trends in your index from your surveys, uh, which determines your relative abundance. And then you have your production models, which analyzes the indices and catch to determine the system of production. And then you have your really complex age structure analytical assessments. And this uses catch and indices by age and size composition sometimes if you're dealing with like really complicated models like we call stock synthesis. And they're used to determine abundance and rate of removals. You know, we used to talk about virtual population analysis, but those are models that are becoming slowly antiquated and we're moving more into the, the statistical cat, catch at age, but more so in recent times, we begin to see state-based models. And I'll briefly talk about what those are, but they all belong in the family of uh, analytical age structured models. I think that when you really think about this, you know, going from really simple to complex models, you know, we're talking about increased number of parameters and of course the data intensity that's required to really use this type of models. And so, and we're talking about biological realism when we're going from really simple to complex because you can provide information about the demographics of the population. You can provide information about the length structure of the population. You bring in the biological logical information that's really useful. So there is a lot of utility into going to really highly complex models. But again, you know, you there's issues with regards to the degrees of freedoms and over parameterization of models. And then you start dealing with issues with like, uh, you know, in terms of model performance. So there's a, there's somewhat of a balance, you know, to not get too complicated, but complex enough to be able to understand the dynamics of the stocks. And so when you have like, you know, really, really complicated model, models, what you do have, you have a decreasing chance of gross model misspecifications and you have an increased probability of like, you know, misidentifying components. And what I talk about, like, you know, decreased chance of gross model specification is that you really get a better sense or better handle in terms of what's happening at the population processes. But when you have all this really copious amount of information that's coming in there, you can certainly, may, uh, there's a high chance of making mistakes in terms of the assumptions that go in there. You know, we talk about maybe natural mortality or maybe it's growth or maybe it's the spatial structure. There's all these things that, you know, we continue to like, you know, dive into and learn more to continue to improve the science. So there is a drawback there. You know, when you go from simple to complex, there's also a, uh, economic consequence there too. So when we're talking about increased data, you know, the cost of collecting that data, you know, it does cost a lot of money. So there's the economic consequence consequences there, but you know, you need to balance that against the significance in terms of like, you know, how important this species to the region. And so when you're thinking from an ecosystem perspective, this is where we as a, uh, as a society really need to uh, begin to make decisions about like, you know, where do we place our values? Because it's a little bit different in context when we're thinking about single species models, just like a sidebar information. So let's switch and talk about the basic population concept. You know, what all of this really three models, categories of models I talked about, you know, what they really try to like, you know, account for is immigration, you know, uh, uh, fish moving into the, in, into a population, uh, recruitment, you know, young fish being born into the population, immigration moving out, and then of course, source of mortality. So this is like an input output system. And so in order for a population to be stable in a given point in time, the sums of your recruitment and your immigration has to equal your exploitation, mortality and immigration. But we know in reality that it's much more complex than that, that the processes do have a lot of variability. And so in a given time point in time, it's very hard where you can find a population where it is the left side of the equation is really balanced out with the right side of the equation here. So quickly speaking here, just to kind of get like, you know, what the data requirements, you know, because I talked about data, but give you a sense of like, you know, the 
various components that goes into the population model. So what I've set up here is sort of a diagram here, sort of telling you what the data requirements are on the top, fitting into the population model, and what's really coming out. What do we really want to know? We want to know the status, and we want to be able to make forecasts. And then, of course, there's all site information there, you know, ecosystems consideration, man-made stress, habitat, climate. And then, of course, when we're thinking about forecasts, I think that, you know, we're beginning to think about the social economic impact as well, too. Often we didn't do that in the past, but we're trying to, you know, take a holistic view looking at it. So quickly, in terms of data requirements, you have your catch, you know, abundance and biology. From the catch, you're talking about your commercial, recreational, and your bycatch from the observer uh, data. In terms of abundance, it can come from, you know, our federal surveys, uh, state surveys uh, also included in this as well, too, that measures like uh, relative abundance in the inshore areas. You can have charter shore, uh, surveys and you can have fishery catch rates uh, as well, too, as a measure of abundance. But those are a bit complicated. But, you know, we are fortunate that we have long time series and we can depend on, you know, uh, consistent time series. But in places that I've been internationally, they have to depend on fishery catch rates. And sometimes they're spatially disjointed and they present some challenges uh, for the stock assessment. And then from a biology, we want to know information about growth. We want to know information about the age, maturity, and that sort of thing. So the basic assessment approach and when we, all these models that we have, whether simple to the complex, when we're asking the question, how large must the population could have been in order to have exhibited the observed trend in relative abundance over time while the observed amount of catch was being removed? So to state a really quick, simple scenario here is that the observed decline in abundance was really steep while catch was high, then catch must have removed a very large fraction of that stock. And one can surmise that this implies that the stock may have been small and fishing mortality is high. So these are the kind of things where we're talking about, you know, what is the relationship between exploitation and abundance in this population and what's remaining. And so this is how the models are really processing that information. And you will see in some of the case studies here that we actually ran into really complicated problems where exploitation rates were not responding to different levels of, of abundance in the population. So just from a simple perspective, here's a diagram that we all know from uh, ecology here, where we're looking at a production curve here, uh, where we have our carrying capacity, and we know that the population slows down as we approach that carrying capacity. Uh, things that we know is that if the removals can be replaced by production each year on average, then the fishery is considered sustainable. Uh, if the catch exceeds production, we expect that there's going to be a decrease in biomass uh, in the population itself. We know that the maximum rate of increase happens at uh, half of that carrying capacity, and that's what we define here as the MSY, the maximum sustainable yield, which is the long-term catch rate taken from a stock, you know, or a stock complex under prevailing ecological conditions or environmental conditions here. The reality is that, you know, this line here that under this production curve that we're trying to calibrate, which is what all models are doing, it doesn't really end up, you know, in a nice little, uh, you know, parabolic function here. There's a lot of natural variation here. We know that there's real fluctuation in populations. We know that the data have sampling error in them. Uh, lack of observation over the full range of the biomass. Sometimes we don't have contrast. And the biomass that are going into the models, when I say biomass, which is a measure of relative abundance, you know, it's really not the true abundance. We just gain a sense of what the relative index is to give us a sense of whether the population is increasing or decreasing. So there's all these sources in here that uh, creates a lot of variability and complexity in terms of calibrating that curve. And just to briefly talk about reference points, uh, so if you conduct a stock assessment, you need some reference points, you know, so it's part of like, you know, what we as scientists and managers use to compare the current status of a stock or a fishery to, uh, to describe what is considered a desirable, desirable state. And so, you know, we want to know what types of management strategies are in place to ensure that, you know, they're, uh, they're sustainable uh, and over the long term. Uh, there are limit reference points and there's target reference points. And oftentimes, you know, you want to like, you know, uh, you know, uh, measure or set your reference point at your target because at the limit levels, there's a lot of uncertainty that certainly can push you over and where, where the population can be in undesirable conditions.
And so just really briefly here, that covers sort of like, you know, really high level, you know, basic information about what stock assessment. And so what I wanted to talk about here is that, you know, we do stock assessment, but there is a process in place. You know, it's not that, you know, we wake up one day and was like, okay, we need to conduct the stock assessment because we need to do it. There's often like, you know, a, a collaborative and a process that we need to go through. And, you know, it's often dictated by the region. So we have this Northeast Regional Coordination Team. They get together. It's made up of folks from the Northeast Fishery Science Center. Uh, management uh, bodies there, the councils and the commissions, and they get together to really uh, decide on, you know, which stocks needs to be assessed. And, you know, we have two sets of like, you know, types of assessments. We have the research track, the management track. The management track is more of our operational where we have an established model in place. And so what we're doing is providing specifications to managers when we update with new data versus when you do a research track is considered a benchmark, which is like new science and retooling the assessment from the ground up. But let's look at this diagram here, or this infographics that I have here in terms of like really understanding what the process is, you know, so when there is an assessment that, you know, is being uh, selected to be done, uh, there is the data and the stakeholder input. And I think this is a very important process because, you know, we collect the information, but we want to always go back to the stakeholders and ask the questions that given what we're seeing in terms of like, you know, summary statistics, does this really, uh, really uh, comply or does this really make sense with what they're seeing out on the water as well, too? And we found it's kind of like, you know, this dialogue type of really useful even in recent times where they're able to like, you know, provide some feedback onto like, you know, what we're seeing and why certain trends exist within our catch data or in our surveys, because they know best as to like, you know, where the fish are and they're there every day and they can certainly be the eyes that, you know, are sort of like filling the gaps because our surveys are considered synoptic in a way. Then there's an assessment planning where the analyst has to like, you know, develop a stock assessment plan, you know, based on data that's being collected and really provide that and based on information that's been compiled from the stakeholder and come up with the plans like, okay, these are what we're going to do sort of moving forward and have like an agreement there. And then that plan moves forward into what we call the assessment oversight panels, usually a one day meeting. It's like, okay, we met with the stakeholder. We've looked at the data. Here are some of the gaps here. Here's how we try to address them or perhaps maybe there's nothing really new to be updated and we just doing you know same business as usual there the assessment oversight panel their job is really to rate the assessment to determine the level of review so we have several levels of reviews whether it needs to be a direct delivery uh, to our management bodies or perhaps it needs like additional peer review which is the highest levels which you might hear if you attend our meetings called like a level three meaning that you're making significant changes in the assessment and therefore some extra review is needed for that we go back we conduct the assessment and um, once the assessment is done, we go into the peer review meeting. That's usually we have our reports ready. That's delivered usually about like, you know, about three weeks in advance so that the reviewers had a chance to review uh, the stock assessment documents. And then we come in and we have to defend the science. So it's all going through your dissertation defense all over again, where you have to defend the work that's being done to make sure that it's vetted properly and it meets the standards to provide management advice. Depending on what happens at the peer review, uh, we have to move forward into the management. So you could bring a model into the peer review. It could pass and, you know, fine. We provide the management advice that's simple and that's straightforward. There are cases where it's a little bit more complicated, where sometimes models do fall apart and it fails and you need to find, we still need to provide advice. And we'll talk about a case example where I demonstrate uh, where models do fail and what do you do next. So I've already talked about this slide. This really talks about like, you know, uh, stock assessments. So I'll skip over that. Recently, we just had like, you know, 14 assessment plans that were appro approved last week. So that's gonna be happening in September, 2022. Most of our meetings are open to the public. So you guys are certainly welcome to join in if you're interested to see, you know, the assessments in action and how the peer review process usually works. And then in terms of application for management, you know, so what I have here is sort of looking at, you know, a probability density of um, 
catch. And so once you have a stock assessment, it moves to uh, to our to the councils. The science and the statistical committee are expected to address scientific uncertainty when addressing the allowable biological catch, which I refer to here as the ABC. In our assessments, we come up with the OFL, which is the overfishing limit. The councils now have to now take into account like how much uncertainty are associated with those overfishing limits and say that, okay, we need to come up with the allowable biological catch or what's considered the ACL, which is the annual catch limits here. And so what this curve demonstrates here is the scientific uncertainty associated with that overfishing limit. And that's why it's really important that we report uncertainty and variance because it gives managers a sense how much buffer they need to really build into the uh, uh, coming up with the allowable biological catch. Uh, the OFL it could be higher or lower. We just know that it falls in there, that the truth is somewhere in between there. If your model is strong enough, you certainly know that you've captured those dynamics. We know that when we're setting the allowable biological catch, you have to make sure that it's less than the overfishing limit because you want to reduce chances where your allowable biological catch will lead to overfishing. So depending on where that truth falls, that buffer is quite useful. So that's more like precautionary in a sense. There's often trade-off analysis that are done here, which is like, you know, how much yield needs to be foregone to be achieved, like, you know, acceptable low chance of overfishing here. So this is where like, you know, sort of like, you know, detail analysis come or uh, detail analysis come into play to like provide what are the risks. So in addition to like, you know, just really looking at the probability of like, you know, of overfishing, you need to also provide some measure of risk there. There's often like, you know, uh, discussions going back and forth between like, you know, council members, the SSC in terms of setting what the ABC is to determine what a desirable, you know, uh, location will be for, you know, the fishing year or for the next upcoming fishing year. So that kind of gives you, you know, a sense of like, you know, what stock assessment is all about, the, the mandates under which we operate. And so now I think it's a good time that we sort of really take into, uh, dive into some case studies here. And here are a couple of uh, stock assessments that I've worked on over my career and wanted to highlight some of the challenges, but I want to give you a little bit about some background about the biology and the distribution of the species, a little bit about the fishery, and then we'll talk about the, some of the assessment challenges here. The first case study I have here is silver hake, and I think this was like, you know, my one of my very first like stock assessment that I went to when I was a junior uh, scientist at the Northeast Fishery Science Center earlier in my career. And this is the one that, you know, was a steepest learning curve, but one of like, you know, experiences that I felt that I learned a lot because I really had a lot of opportunity to, you know, take a lot of free range to do a lot of really interesting and creative things here. So for those who may not really know about silver hay, got species that, you know, is distributed from Newfoundland all the way down to South Carolina. We have two separate stocks in the U.S. waters. Uh, there's some uh, in the Canadian, but we have the northern and the southern, and it's split around the Georges Bank area, north and south. Uh, silver hake are really important predators to the ecosystem. Uh, their diet varies by size, season, and migration, spawning, and age. And so... When we look at the history of this stock here, uh, back in the 1950s and 1960s, as you can see here, our plots here are really showing uh, the total commercial landings going back to the mid 1950s here. The distant water fleas were quite active then. And you can see that we had exploitation that picked over 90,000 metric tons in the north around in, in the mid 1960s and well over 250,000 metric tons in the south in 1965. And so those were like really, you know, really huge landings. And you look at that compared to like, you know, recent history here, uh, we see that the stock has, some, has declined. Uh, we had the departure of the distant water fleet like around the late 1970s, but we still saw a decline in the stock and it never, we never saw landings, you know, as large as we saw historically here. And so here was a stock here that, you know, I had a chance to like, you know, really dig into its ecological significance where I was interested in looking at predatory consumption. And what we did here was able to look at a minimum level of predatory consumption to inform natural mortality assumptions in the model. Oftentimes, we just look at the maximum age in the population and use that to determine 
to make an assumption about natural mortality, but here we actually had some biological evidence here to actually inform it, even though it wasn't perfect, but at least we had some stomach contents we were able to expand to like predatory consumption and come up with what we call natural mortality or we call it M2 in the models. And so here's a plot here that sort of gives you the cast of characters who are involved in the consumption of silver hake here. And even silver hake is actually considered a predator because their size dependent uh, predatory consumption that happens within silver hake itself when you look at its life history as well. But overall, the biggest thing that we learned here was that goosefish was actually a major predator of silver hake. And so we often wonder that, you know, perhaps, you know, when we do have like like, you know, good young this year classes, if goosefish population is doing well, it's likely that this can have an impact in, on silver hake population as well, if they're very active. And so here, what I've done here is really just summarize, you know, just a, a, a subset of like, you know, predators that are really involved that are considered uh, really important. And so we use this information as a fleet in our models so we have our commercial removals but we also said that we have removals by predators as well too to use that to estimate natural mortality as opposed to really just assume it in the model so one of the challenges we ran into with silver hick is that what i have here is a measure of the adult population over time. And so when we do the assessments, we often have various runs. And I think I may have done over 100 different model runs here for this uh, for this assessment. This is an analytical assessment to age structured uh, information. And so what we did find out is that various assumptions that the stock was quite sensitive to it, whether we assumed uh, a different level of selectivity. That means how the gear interact with the fishery, whether we assumed whether it's flat or whether we assumed that at older ages that the gear was not really seeing a whole lot of those older age fish. It was quite sensitive. And it makes sense in the model that, you know, that those type of assumptions would be quite sensitive or really small assumptions about like, you know, like changes in natural mortality or like, you know, how we inform our survey information, we begin to see that there was a scaling problem where we begin to see different collections of plots with different results. And so depending on what you believe uh, going into this assessment here, you can have different perception of the stock. And all of these have like, you know, confidence bounds around them. But what I have here are the point estimates of the different type of runs here. So the ones where you saw like, you know, in, at the end of the time series where you saw a scale up of the populations is where we assumed that the gear was not really seeing a whole lot of the older age fish and perhaps that there is a cryptic population that's growing there. Uh, perhaps the gear can actually effectively capture those older age population, uh, uh, age structure or size fish. And so, and therefore we expect that, you know, that the perception of the population will be different where we see a decline towards the end of the time series. This was a huge debate. And unfortunately, you know, with all the work that we did, the reviewers came back and was like, this was effort well done. There's a lot of variables that was done there. There was a lot of ecosystem considerations here. There was a lot of assumptions. We actually moved this model further than we have ever in the history of doing its assessment. But unfortunately, given sort of the sensitivity of the results to various different assumptions that, you know, this is not ready for prime time, meaning that we can't use this for management advice, which makes sense because you can't have results like this that are sort of all over the place telling you different things and how would managers be able to be to make uh, come up with advice based on this really variability in different assumptions and the sensitivity to the outcome here. And the same thing happens with level of removals here. So this is looking at fish and mortality here. We see that, you know, consequently it had like a scale and effect. So what did we have to do? So we came in here, you know, put all our eggs in one basket. And this was lesson learned, you know, as a junior scientist to come in here. And we didn't really have like backup plans like we used to, like we do now. And so we came in knowing that, okay, this models had reasonable diagnostics and perhaps what we can do is put this to the reviewers and, you know, really debate the merits and give them the evidence and perhaps maybe pick a model bad mistake. I think that that led to like, you know, hesitant for the reviewers to make decisions because we didn't have the strong proposals in front of us to say that this is the model we wanted to move forward with. 
we gave them a preference, but we didn't want to nudge the reviewers. So that was the strategy, but unfortunately that strategy didn't work. The other like, you know, downside to this whole thing that we didn't have a backup plan as to like, okay, now that we don't have an assessment model, how do we provide advice? Well, we can fall back onto the old uh, approaches that we have in place, but the old approaches were no longer useful. And so within 24 hours, we had to come up with an index approach. And an index approach is pretty much using the survey information directly and really understanding what's going on and calculating some measure of exploitation from the catch data removals and the survey information, which you see on the top right, which is a relative exploitation index. And so what we looked at here is like it became apparent, you know, just really looking at the data that if you look at the abundance to the left where the population showed an increase like around the 1990s there, and you look at the relative exploitation to the right, the population is, you know, there hasn't been any change at all. You expect that, you know, when the abundance is high, that exploitation should be low. And when abundance is low, that exploitation will be, will be vice versa. And so, and we looked at the catch data. You look, go back to that and you notice the catch has been relatively flat, you know, in recent times. And so here we noticed that this is one of those cases that I termed, you know, model resistant. And so we needed to like, you know, figure out, okay, now that we're in a situation where we have a model resistant, how do we use this information to provide advice? Measures of uncertainty is really important here. And so we came up with a really interesting way to use the data to characterize uncertainty around the survey estimate and the relative exploitation. And we came up with this giant matrix and say that, okay, we able to come up with an OFL, we come up with a product of like, you know, the three year moving index from the survey and the relative exploitation, and we are able to characterize the uncertainty on that, then we can come up with an OFL point estimate and also characterize the uncertainty around that. And then when we go to our council to our management bodies, they can determine the level of ABCs that, can, that they feel that is reasonable for this stock. And we felt that this was a success story in terms of like, you know, a path forward, because this was one of the first few cases where we actually characterized uncertainty around like, you know, really simple empirical approaches. And then, so what you have here is to the left here, sort of like the distribution curve here about around your overfishing limit and to the right there are the risk analysis. Analysis uh, that sort of tells you that if you fish at a certain level, here's the probability that you're going to exceed that overfishing limit, depending on what you peak here. And so the moral of the story here is that you know when you come into your assessments, even though you have your best case scenario right in front of you, have a backup plan. So that was something that we learned. That was a lesson learned here. Another thing that you know that's kind of interesting about this approach here is that you know while it's nice that we can characterize the uncertainty. Something in me still tells me that I'm not so certain about the performance of this simple approaches here. Uh, recently, we had a research track with one of our colleagues, Dr. Chris Legault, who actually looked at this index approaches and we did tons of simulations to kind of understand some of the performance there. And so one of the things we learned at the end of the day is that you're better off using your age structured models, even though they may have poor diagnostics relative to using some of the simple approaches or either sometimes they actually perform similarly in some cases here. So there's still a lot of ongoing work here. I'm particularly working on the Silver Hick where I'm actually doing some simulation work and looking for some students to work with to kind of understand how well this is working in terms of the performance. So far in terms of providing advice, the stock has been doing well, particularly in the North where we've seen increases in recent years, but something just, you know, is there that we don't really have a sense of how to quantify the performance of various ways when we pick the allowable biological catch. And so I think a simulation study is an opportunity here to be able to dig into this a little bit more to, pro, you know, to provide some insight on how well these uh, tools really perform under various conditions. So the second case study that I have here is the case with Southern New England Mid-Atlantic Yellowtail. And this is one of the stocks that I worked on uh, during my PhD uh, with my advisor, Dr. Steve Cadron. And uh, one of the things I did during my PhD was actually develop a movement mortality model from tagging studies to really understand the impact of movement and in, in the assessment and the dynamics of the stocks and what, how that impact abundance and how that impact uh, removals as well too.
And so just a little bit of a background here uh, in terms of the range of distribution of the species, uh, ranging from Labrador southward to the Chesapeake Bay. We don't, we no longer see them in the Chesapeake Bay, given the truncation of the population. Uh, they go just as far down as the mid-Atlantic area. They prefer sandy bottoms. You can find them 40 to 70 meters. And they're described as relative sanitary. But you know, studies we saw during our a tagging study suggest that they actually conduct off-bottom movements in the middle of the night. And it's uh, hypothesized that the reason for their off-bottom movement, it's probably related to, you know, prey availability or related to predation or migration. And so what we think that's happening in terms of how they migrate, which I find quite interesting, is that they rise up in the water and they sort of kind of ride the tides, which uh, probably translocates them from one location to the other. Tagging studies actually overall, even though we see some movements, the movements were not so significant. So I think that, you know, the evidence is still suggests that they're relatively sanitary, where a lot of the tag releases were still uh, recovered in the same areas that we uh, released them as well. So here's a case example where we attempted to incorporate environmental information here. This is a stock that, you know, great history uh, to it. Uh, there's three stocks of yellowtail. We have one in the southern New England, which is the one that I lead. And I'm also listing Cape Cod Gulf of Maine. And we have the Georges Bank stock. Uh, historically, uh, the Georges Bank stock used to be the dominant stock. And then over time, it shifted now in recent times where Cape Cod Gulf of Maine is actually the more dominant stock. What we've seen across all three yellowtail stocks is a re reduction in productivity where the stock is not really responding well, despite, you know, several management measures that has been put in place here. And so what you see here in the top right is sort of like a measure of like, you know, removals, you know, back dating back to uh, the mid 1930s there and then we saw where the distant water fleet was really active in the 60s and then they exited in the 1970s and then in the early 1980s and late 1980s we saw the spikes in catches and those were related to some strong gear classes we saw in the survey and ever since then since 1987 the stock has just remained really flat hasn't responded at all and we've seen here, here's a measure of fishing mortality, the top, the bottom right there. And we've seen that there's been a decline, but yet the population hasn't really responded so well. Uh, for this talk, we use a variety of surveys. And so we actually use local surveys and a bunch of uh, center surveys as well, you know, in terms of characterizing the trends in abundance for the population, which you see here on the top left corner here. And so the conundrum here is that we have a wicked recruitment problem. You can see we had that strong 1980, strong 1987 year class. And then when you look at the deviation in recruitment and since 1990s moving forward, stock has not responded at all. And so we asked the questions that why has the stock not responded? Well, a couple of things we do know is that we know that there are some environmental force and influences here. Studies have suggest that you know they do well during uh, in cold temperatures where productivity tends to be high. So a lot of the work that has been done in the past by Sullivan uh, suggests that the strong gear class is also associated with really cold water, where we found out that the stock tend to do well. And so we're wondering that perhaps maybe this could be related to a phenomenon known as the cold pool cold pool, which is the remnant cold water within a region or an area in which we felt that, you know, could have uh, contributed to recruitment success. So we're like, okay, let's take a look at the cold pool index to really see what's going on. And so this was developed by John Hare, actually, um, when we were working in. This was when he was still in Narragansett as uh, the branch chief and was uh, directly involved in our science and contributing to our stock assessment. And one of the things he uh, really found out was that the cold pool was increasing in recent years. And what that really means that there is warming that's occurring in the southern range of the population. And so with this warming that's occurring in this cold pool, we felt that the habitat or suitable habitat may be shrinking over time and partly could explain what we're seeing with regards to uh, the reduced productivity of the stock as well. <laughs> 
So we decided to bring the code pool into the assessment and try to model that to understand the relationship between adult population and then the uh, recruitment. And so there, we begin to see some relationships there in the model there. But one of the questions we did ask was that what's the relationship between age one recruitment and the code pool index? And unfortunately, what you see here is a gunshot blast of like, you know, points of the index where the relationship was quite poor. And so here is an attempt where we intended to bring in environmental information, but given the poor relationships sometimes that, you know, often don't show up and sort of like, you know, really trying to understand the mechanisms that are really driving the processes in the population, it sometimes could be quite difficult. We do believe that these environmental processes are playing in the background, but maybe there is a much deeper mechanism that we really need to understand. Or perhaps maybe it's a modeling framework of how these models really treat these environmental variables. And so one of the things I wanted to bring uh, to your attention, and some of you are probably aware of this, is that sort of moving from uh, what are typical traditional age structure models to state space models. And Tim Miller and some others have been developing some really uh, uh, cool features for our age structure models where they're really looking at how we uh, treat variants within the model. How do we treat process errors in the populations? How we treat measurement errors in the population? And they were able to come around and bring in the cold pool index. And what they saw here to the right here, which is a measure of the cold pool index, that if you bring that in in a stock and a recruit relationship, which is the adult and the um, recruitment population, and you begin to bring in the cold pool index, we begin to see that it begins to explain the reduction in recruitment in recent years with this very, uh, this lines here going from the blue to the red to the yellows and the greens down here that it begins to understand that because of this warming that perhaps that it really begins to set like some kind of precedent that this mechanism between copal and the reduction in recruitment does really exist and but it depends on how you treat those variances in your model one other thing that's really neat about this state space model is in terms of model performance. And so what we have here is a measure of model stability to the left here in this matrix plots here. And what we do here is that we try to peel several years in the model and re-estimate the models. And what we have here is fishing mortality to the top row and the bottom row is the adult uh, population, the adult biomass here. And what we see here that the model actually behaves very well, where it definitely demonstrates that it's fairly stable over time, with the exception of recruitment that tends to be a little bit noisy. So I think that there is some promise here with state space model. And in 2024, Southern New England is actually up for a research track where we'll have an opportunity to bring, bring in state-based models and really interesting uh, framework into really understanding some of the environmental information to understand what's happening with the population dynamics for yellowtail. So here, just want to like, you know, begin to step back as like, okay, next generation of stock assessment. When we think about this from an agency perspective, we want to be able to do things that's much more holistic. You know, we're trying to get away from like single species stock assessment. We want to begin to link things to ecosystems. We want to be more innovative and we want to make sure that we're timely and effective. And that requires us in terms of data delivery. So there's a lot of neat initiatives that are going on in the background in terms of like, you know, really supporting all these three initiatives, whether it comes from automation perspective, really thinking about different ways of how you model processes and how you begin to fold in a lot of environmental information. And so when we talk about the growing advancements in stock assessments, and I have a few more minutes and I'll be wrapping up here, you know, we want to talk, we want to start to think about how do we account for environmental effects? We look at our terms of references, they're really interested in how we bring in climate information, how do we bring in habitat, ocean temperatures. Ecological interaction is really important. We talked about that with Silver Hick, where we're looking at trophic dynamics and predatory consumption understanding scale of removals of fisheries relative to like, you know, predators versus actually uh, various fleets that operate on them, uh, what the implications could be on natural mortality. And then of course, an interesting uh, area that's grown and it's really popular is management strategy evaluation, where we come up with simulation techniques to provide insights on consequences of alternative management scenarios.
So with this, I'd like to really wrap up and give you a few take-home messages that stock assessment is operational science and it fulfills a mandate. So it's not a science that we do in a way that's, you know, discovery. And yes, there's some aspect of discovery, but it's largely driven by the mandates to make sure that we provide advice. Uh, there's lots of opportunity for research and to progress the science. Uh, stock assessment continues to build greater capacity to facilitate the stakeholder engagement in planning, policy, and conflict resolution. We didn't talk much about stakeholder engagement, but what we're seeing here that, you know, when you really invest a lot of time in stakeholder engagement, you begin to improve trust between stakeholders and the science. And then, you know, stock assessment involves strong collaboration with academic partners and government agencies. So it's a collaborative, uh, you know, sort of science that, you know, requires us to like, you know, lean onto our partners to continue to make progress and to continue to improve the science. And with that said, I would like to thank you for indulging me for the last 55 minutes and I'll take any questions, comments that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was an amazing overview of uh, fisheries management and stock assessment. Thanks, Larry. Are there any questions? And, and for those of you who might be online, if you want to use the Q&A, we can get your questions that way. Anyone in the room want to ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for Richard because I can't see the graph of that Did you, Larry, you probably didn't hear that, right? So question. I, if I heard that someone was interested in this plot, which uh, included the predatory removals yeah. or the assessment. Okay. So yes, and what's how the question? Seals, how are seals involved? Oh, yeah. So that's a very good question. And that was one of the things that we felt was limiting about this analysis, that it didn't really include marine mammal consumption or even bird consumption as well too. So this analysis actually focuses focused just on fin fish removals. And so you consider this as the minimum removals and minimum estimate of natural mortality in here. But we certainly, one of the caveats that we did say that this analysis does not really include was like, you know, those two components. And so the way we address that in that model was that there's this Alias in factor that we need to account for that even though we have fin fish natural mortality, we needed to account for all this other sources of natural mortality to be able to be able to get a better handle on that. So I think that yes, future assessment, I think the heron, uh, the Atlantic heron actually did consider looking at marine mammals. I know John DeRobo was looking at that and working with uh, marine mammal folks to be able to get a better sense on the impact on, uh, you know, predator removals for his stock. Yeah, in fact, Shoals Marine Lab, the turn colony, they contributed to that herring model with how many really? herring the terns are eating. How many there people have, have seen the turn colony, been over there? Ornithology, right? Did they talk about hake? Yeah. Yes. Yes, they did. Hake are definitely among the prey items that the terns are feeding to their chicks and feeding themselves. So that's cool. Any other questions? Any? I don't see any online. All right, one more, yeah. Um, I guess I'll also ask related to this plot as well. Um, what is your, what's your means of scaling from individual predation observations up to this level for populations, both of, from the predator and the prey perspective? Yes, thank you for that question. Great question. So I sort of glossed over this. And so the details there is that, you know, you have uh, stomach uh, consumption, you know, so where we get stomach data. And so what we re really do is that we take the individual levels and look at what the population estimates are for each of the species for their relative stock assessment. We don't have stock assessment estimate of abundance, then we perhaps we look at trying to get uh, information from the surveys where we can use swept area biomass to actually capture what is the absolute biomass. And so we use that information to sort of scale the individual to the population level. We also count for seasonal 
and spatial trends because we all certainly understand that not all this stocks do overlap, you know, um, uh, consistently. And so there's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes there. And there's also uh, a parameter that we also account for, which accounts for the digestion in terms of processing, you know, silver hake that's being consumed, which is very different from one species to the other. So all this comes through together in terms of really scaling from the stomach contents and trying to scale it to the population level is what you see here. What I don't have here, and I hate plotting things that don't have confidence bound is the measure of certainty around those. And I will tell you that when I really looked at the stomach content sample size, I was a little bit concerned in terms of like, you know, really putting a lot of faith into the data because when you begin to take individual information and you have very small sample size and you begin to scale at the population level, you can in easily introduce bias. So while we do have lots of stomach data for silver hake, you know, one of the things we're very careful for is to make sure that we're paying attention to sample size of how we're scaling things and what the implications can be at the population level. Great, thank you. All right, so in the interest of time, we're going to stop there. And um, remember, we record all of these and we put them on our website. So if you want to review, I feel like the fishery science class is going to like, you know, learn a bit more and then go back to this like over and over because there was so much good information in here, especially for you all. So it'll be online. And our next talk is on June 7th, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. 8 p.m. <laughs> we'll be eating breakfast at that time. Anyway, and uh, Dr. Ian Owens from the Lab of Ornithology at Cornell is going to be here for a few days, actually. So all of that information, you can join it. If you're not going to be on the island, you can still watch that talk online. And all of them, of course, are recorded there. And it's a place on our website. So thank you, everyone, for your attention. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank really you. Appreciate thank it. you, Larry. All right. It's a pleasure. <laughs> There's everybody. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.